Hey, do you ever struggle with relinquishing your desires and trusting God's, surrendering yourself, abandoning yourself into the desires, the will, the plan of God? For a lot of years, I struggled as a younger Christian with a lesser understanding of God's true heart. That's why, partially why I've given my life to communicating his word and trying to be a good representative of his heart. We tend to downsize God. We tend to upsize our goodness and we tend to downsize his goodness. And for the next few minutes, I want to reverse that, hopefully, in your life and mine. And in mine, I want to upsize God's goodness, God's generosity. I want us to get a bigger sense of who God is. You realize if you could if you could watch your life on a stream, on a video stream, lived out in experience of all of the plan and purposes and blessings of God, all the vast goodness he wants to pour out upon you. If you could watch that video stream and then watch the video stream of life lived according to your plans, your dreams, your ideals, if you could watch the two streams and then step back and choose, you would run fast and hard from your plans and you would run with total abandon into the heart and into the goodness of God because he is that good. I'm going to mess up the English language. He is much gooder than you could ever be to yourself. He's much more lavish and lavish and generous with us than we would be to ourselves. I think it was C.S. Lewis that said uh, we, we're like children that are happy to play in the gutter uh, because we don't know what is meant by a holiday at sea. I'll, t- I'll, I'll circle back around and tell you a story that, uh, that is more a modern version of that quote that happened in my life. Uh, but today, we're in Psalm 104. Welcome to Growing in the Gospel. I'm Pastor Kerry, and we take a few minutes every day to slow walk right now through the Psalms. And we're in Psalm 104. We're picking it up in verse 10, and we're seeing the creative generosity of God, the power, the love, the grace, the generosity, the goodness of God in all of his creation. And we left off yesterday in verse 9 with his power over water and how he uh, how he literally created everything that is in six days and rested on the seventh. We talked about that. Today we're going to be talking about being satisfied with the generosity, the overwhelming abundance of the heart of God. I want to just quickly say we're also doing two other things on the channel. We're going through Revelation every Monday, uh, airing Sunday's message, and then we're going through also, we're finishing up this week, the series Rhythms. That's a long-form teaching series about God, how God does work in different stages of our lives, different seasons of our lives. Um, uh, fall, winter, spring, summer. And uh, then we're going to start a new series next week called The Christmas Oracles. And I know that this will be an encouragement to you. It's it's the Old Testament's perspective on what we call Christmas. Well, let's pick it up today in verse 10. And I, I believe God has something really wonderful for us. Verses 10 through 18 today in Psalm 104. So God, we're talking about, we're in this running in this lane of God's creative power, authority, and, and essentially his goodness, his good control over all of his creation. And we need to think, by the way, we live. We need to remember we live in a fallen version of, of creation. We live in a broken version of creation. Death and sin uh, were not designed to invade creation, but at the fall, Satan tempted mankind. See, Adam had been given dominion over this earth. Mankind was given dominion. But when Adam chose sin, defiance, rebellion against God, when Adam and Eve fell, they essentially handed the title deed of creation over to Satan, who is, as Jesus said, now the prince of this world. So uh, Jesus is redeeming all things, and we're going to end the story with a new heaven and a new earth and a a brand new creation. But what what we know as creation, as beautiful and as wonderful as it is, it is, uh, it is under the curse of sin and death and the kingdom, the, the temporary kingdom of darkness and death. Um, but it, it's not what God originally intended. It's not what God is going to redeem and restore to his final intentions. And we'll come back to that. But let's read together. He sendeth the springs into the valleys, which run among the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field. The wild asses quench their thirst. By them shall the fowls of the heaven 
have their habitation, which sing among the branches. He watereth the hills from his chambers. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of thy works. And he causeth the grass to grow for the cattle and the herb for the service of man, that he may bring forth food out of the earth and wine that maketh glad the heart of man and oil to make his face to shine and bread that strengtheneth man's heart. The trees of the Lord are full of sap, the cedars of Lebanon, which he hath planted, where the, uh, where the birds make their nests. As for the stork, the fir trees are her house. The high hills are a refuge for the wild goats and the rocks for the conies. Now, here's my sense of this, okay? I think this is David. David spent a lot of time out in the creation. He was a shepherd. So if you've been to Israel, uh, you can you can picture this. Let me try to describe the land of Israel. I've been there many times and so praying for the nation of Israel right now. It's heartbreaking what's happening there. But uh, if you could track with me from west to east, the western coast of the country is the Mediterranean coast. It's generally a beach with a cliff. And then there's these, there's these coastal lowlands that start to rise. The further inland you go, the more that you get into foothills. It's very lush. It's very green. It's very Mediterranean. Uh, it's very fruitful. Until you go further south towards Gaza, it becomes, it becomes more and more desert the further south you go towards uh, the Sinai Peninsula. But it's very fertile. <clears throat> As you get up into the foothills, you, you come through the foothills, which are also lush and forested and green and beautiful. And then you get into really the mountains, uh, which is it's not a long drive from the Mediterranean up to the peaks of the mountains, is uh, Jerusalem. Uh, it's it's an hour, hour and a half maybe, um, and y- you get up high into the mountains, which is why all throughout Scripture you read they went up to Jerusalem. Now those mountains run north and south; they're kind of like a spine in the country. Uh, the that those mountains kind of as you go further north, they kind of turn, they kind of dog leg to the west and to the north, and they kind of come to a ridge uh, that's called Carmel. Okay, and that ridge comes to a final peak or point up above Haifa, which is called, uh, you know, which we know as Mount Carmel, where uh, Elijah faced off with the prophets of Baal. Well, just over that ridge is the Valley of Jezreel, which is kind of a dogleg valley that that runs um, across the country, kind of widens out. It starts up north towards the Lebanon, border of Lebanon. And then it, do- it widens and it dog legs to the east and it empties out into the, uh, the Jordan Valley. Um, and then you have, from that point forward, you have more hills, which are Galilee and the north. You have the lower and the upper Galilee up towards the border of Lebanon. And there's hills and valleys up there all the way. Coming back to the south center of the country where Jerusalem is and those, that spine of hills. This is really important. We're going somewhere. Um, those hills run north and south, and those hills are rocky, stony. Uh, they're hard. They're, they're the hardest part of the country to live in, at least for ancient people, because they weren't near a water source. Remember that. That's really important. But this is the spine of the country, and there's a road, there's a highway, an ancient highway that comes down the spine of the country, up and down and up and down and up and down. And we know that as the highway of the patriarchs. Why? Because Abraham... Isaac, Jacob, uh, all the sons of Jacob, Joseph, they, their stomping grounds are all along that highway. Okay, that it's we say highway, and it is today a modern highway, uh, but it's it's we most of it's the West Bank, what we know as the West Bank. And if you've ever visited there, um, it's uh, it's a stark it's a stark contrast going in and out of those checkpoints, but Shechem is to the north near Nablus, modern-day Nablus, which is the headquarters of the Palestinian Authority, um, but uh, where where Jacob's, where Joseph's brothers tended their sheep, Shechem, where Jacob's well is, uh, it's what we know as Samaria. As you move south out of the west, out of the modern-day West Bank, you come down the to the through those hills to Jerusalem. As you continue to go south out of Jerusalem, you come to Hebron. 
uh, which is where the cave of the patriarchs. It's it's where the burial places are. It's where uh, it's where Abraham bought the burial site for Sarah, and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob are buried there. If you continue to go south again, now you're in the West Bank again, Hebron. You get to Beersheba. Uh, these are all the ancient cities of the patriarchs, and and this is where the kind of the hills end at Beersheba, and then they go further south uh, towards where some of the uh, attacks happened on October the 7th. All right, so you've got that Mediterranean coast to the west, you've got the foothills, and then you've got the spine of larger hills that run north and south, and then as you come out of those hills to the east, you immediately enter into desert in the south, the Negev Desert, uh, the wilderness, as as it's called in Scripture, and you eventually arrive at the Dead Sea to the south. And as you go north, the Jordan River Valley, the Jordan Rift. It's a it's a it's an earthquake. It's a uh, fault line. And you, as you go north, you come to, into more and more green and lush. You get to uh, the Sea of Galilee, and now you're in the region of Galilee. And you work your way up out of the Sea of Galilee to the north, up through the hills. And you're in a, another lush area, lush valley, all the way up to Dan, which is all the way to the north. So that's a little geological or geographical tour of the nation of Israel. Now, it's really important, and so much of the Bible is geographical, that when you read these scriptures and you understand that land, all of a sudden this comes to life. Now, with that in mind, let's go back through this and let's put ourselves into the mind of David or an ancient Israelite who's living off the land, who's grazing and raising and growing crops and raising herds and shepherding sheep off this land. So the land is everything, okay? The land is life. The land is livelihood, all right? And and who's in charge of the land? God is. And now David is celebrating the generosity and the goodness and the abundance of the heart of God over the land. So he sends springs into the valleys which run among the hills. So I'm thinking right now of the springs of uh, uh, coming out of the hills, coming into the Dead Sea where David hid. My mind is going blank, and I'm really bummed that it's going blank. Um, the, it's not the cave of Adullam. It's the other cave. It's where he met Saul. It's where Saul, uh, where they were hi- the men, David and his men were hiding in the cave. And it's a beautiful little oasis. But the, 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 here's the interesting thing about that cave, and this isn't a rabbit trail. Um, as David and his men are hiding in the cave and go, Saul goes into the mouth of the cave to relieve himself, uh, you're, I'm always wondering, my whole life I'm wondering, why, uh, how could 300 men be in that cave and Saul not hear a single thing? Because there's a spring. And there, there's a spring coming out of the hills, out of the rocks, and there's a huge waterfall that's coming out of that. It's a huge cave, first of all. And it's coming, it's falling in that cave, which is creating white noise, brown noise. It's creating a sound, an audio mask. I don't know if you've ever used a noise machine, but that's what's happening. These men could have been having full-blown conversations. They could have been sneezing and coughing and everything, and Saul would not have heard them because of the... The, the rush of the water coming out of that cave. But there's something about that spring that's interesting. Uh, the scientists in Israel wanted to know how many, uh, where that water was coming from. And so they put uh, some dye, they put some dye into some rainwater coming out, coming down from Jerusalem and finding its way into the ground. And that dye didn't come out of that spring, red dye, until years later. And I forget how many years. I want to say it was seven or eight or ten years later, the red dye came out of this spring. What's the point? David understands the importance of water and springs in regions like this. It's life. It's life for the animals. It's life for the humans. And God fills those springs with water that run among the hills. And what happens? It gives drink to every beast of the field and to the wild asses. Verse 12, it gives lodging place to the fowls, the birds. They find places to live near those springs, and they sing and dance among the branches near those springs. Verse 13 is especially meaningful. He waters the hills from his chambers. So if you remember in the Old Testament, uh, God told Abraham to go up to Beth, uh, 
Jacob was at Bethel. I'm trying to remember if Abraham was at Bethel. I get confused on all the journeys. These guys ran that spine of the country so many times. Uh, I want to say Abraham was there as well, but it was that place. Yeah, it was Bethel. It was that place where God told Abraham, this is the land. This is where you're going to be. It was that place where Abraham and Lot parted ways. And you can look from Bethel, which is in the West Bank today, but you can go there and uh, uh, there's a kibbutz there, there's there's communities there, settlements, it's amazing. Um, but you can stand on that hill and you can look and see the Mediterranean in one direction and you can see the well-watered plains of Sodom in the other direction, uh, the, the valley, the Jordan River Valley, and the land on the opposite side, which was fertile. And you can see how Lot made the choice to go down. Why? Because there was water. There was water. And where they're standing, it's rocks. It's, it's still to this day, it's rocks and dry land. If you're going to live in the mountains, if you're going to live in those hills where the patriarchs lived, you're totally dependent on rain. And it was God saying to Abraham, I don't want you to trust the water sources. I want you to trust me. I want you to trust me to give you the rain, to give you the water. I want you to live a life of faith instead of a life of sight. And doesn't he still call us to that today? And sometimes he works the same ways in our lives. We don't, we don't have to calculate it that way. But literally when Abraham and Isaac and Jacob lived, chose to live in those hills in obedience to God, they were saying, we won't be dependent on the easy water sources. We will trust solely on the water that comes from God's chambers. And David in this psalm is recounting that God produces water from the heavens. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of of thy works. Verse 14, he causes the grass to grow for cattle and herb for the service of man that he may bring forth food out of the earth. Interesting things about those hills. When you're driving from Jerusalem south or Jerusalem north to uh, to Shechem up through the West Bank, as you take that drive, you would marvel every hillside. It's, number one, the amount of rocks is unbelievable. But every hillside has been terraced. Over thousands of years, the terraces are still there that have been notched into the hillside. And those those hills, as long as there's rain, those hills are still very fertile. You can see ancient remnants of high places and altars everywhere, all throughout the land. Um, you can see you can see that this land has been settled time and time again, and those terraces have been farmed time and time again. And God has sent rain. It's all a picture of God's goodness, God's consistency, God's faithfulness, God's generosity. Verse 15, he makes wine that makes glad the heart of man and oil to to make his face to shine and bread which strengthens man's heart. Do, Do you understand the goodness of God, the lavishness of God that he cares about? Yeah, good taste. And, and good lotions for our skins and, and good food for, uh, you know, when you read bread which strengtheneth man's heart, I'm pretty sure that's pizza. So uh, verse 16, the trees of the Lord are full of sap, the cedars of Lebanon, which he planted. Uh, we think sap, we think sugar, we think uh, sweetness, we think syrup. Uh, we think trees that are strong, cedars of Lebanon, strong, huge, massive trees, good for construction, good for durability. Uh, Verse 17, the birds make their nests all over the planet. The stork, the fir trees, her house, the high hills are a refuge for wild goats and rocks for conies. I'll I'll wrap this up. We're going someplace good. I hope you're still with me. The conies are these little uh, rabbit-like creatures. They don't have big ears like rabbits, but they look like like large... Large mice. Uh, they're not rats. They're not that ugly. They're cute. Um, they're 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 little furry creatures that climb in the rocks. Um, and if you're down in the in the Negev desert, you'll see them all over the place, as well as uh, the wild goats. Uh, we were there uh, last year, a year ago, actually today. A year ago today, I was in Israel, and we were at this spring where David uh, climbed and hid in the cave, and a herd of these wild goats came through. And I mean, there were hundreds of them. And the, 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 the horns, the sizes of their horns, some of them were small, some of them were big. They would climb up in these trees to eat. It was easy to see how they'd get caught in thickets. Uh, but these goats and conies, they're just living. They're being who God created them, what God created them to be. Now, all of this to paint this beautiful picture. What is David celebrating? 
Let me list it for you, and then I'm going to read something really important to you. Uh, He is celebrating God's, he's the God of abundance. He's the God of generosity. He's a God of provision. He's a God of security. He wants us to live in total dependence on him. He's the God who supersedes, who, who superintends all of his abundant creation. He's the God that when he fed 20,000 people on a hillside, they all got as much as they wanted, and there were still 12 baskets to to remain. What does that mean? That he can speak these things into existence. That paying your bills and feeding your stomach and taking care of your family is no problem for God. And he wants you, he calls us to live a life of dependence. And and we live in a world that's broken and, 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 and sin-stricken, and so we live in a world of greed and scarcity, but we belong to a God of abundance. And I'm not talking about a health, wealth, and prosperity gospel uh, where we can leverage God like he's a genie. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about I can rest at peace that God's going to meet my needs and take care of me until the day he calls me home. I am his child, and he is going to, if he provides for the wild donkeys and the, and the storks and the birds, if he takes care of them, he's going to take care of you, he's going to take care of me. He's a God of abundance and generosity and provision. He's a God of security. In all of this, he's a God of beauty. It's all beautiful. It's all rhythmic and synchronized and beautifully abundant. And in all of this, he puts me at peace. I'm teaching tonight at uh, at our church on peace. Uh, Paul ended his letter to 2 Thessalonians saying, uh, peace. Uh, uh, By all means and all ways at all times, may God put you at peace. So he wants us to be at rest. I love this passage of scripture because it reminds me that my God is not greedy, he's not stingy, he's not withholding. I can upsize my sense of his goodness and his generosity, his lavishness, his mercy, his love. He is lavish. When I tend to think of him as stingy or withholding blessings or greedy, that's a wrong image of God. It's a wrong perspective. Now, I said I'm going to read you something. I wrote a book not long ago that was released a few weeks ago. I told you about it. It's called Steady Strength. Uh, reversing ministry's dangerous drift to depletion. I hope some of you have picked it up and are reading it. I'm not trying to just sell you a book on this on this uh, daily broadcast. I think you all know that. This is aimed at servant uh, people who are serving in ministry. So if you have a pastor or someone you love, this would make a good gift for them. It's av- available wherever books are sold. But at the end of the book, I'm going to go to the very end, I read a letter, I share a letter that was shared with me by a wonderful friend, Um, a couple in our church who have been our friends now for 11 years. This lady that wrote me this letter, we were coming back from a sabbatical, my wife and I, and we were restoring and resting up and just celebrating 10 years of of service at our church. And uh, this lady was welcoming us back, her and her husband, and she wrote us a very kind letter. And it was attached to a gallon of maple syrup, a gallon of maple syrup. And the interesting thing about this is that she had come through literally a one-year battle against COVID. She nearly died more than once. The doctors say she is a one-in-millions miracle that she even survived. She was intubated uh, three different times on a ventilator, and uh, it was just an amazing journey of of, uh, day-to-day, nail-biting, wondering if God was going to preserve her life. And she's a very good friend, and we were so thankful that God has spared her. And to this day, as she just came off oxygen, her lungs are getting stronger and stronger, and every day we're thanking God. Her name's Amy, and this is the letter she wrote to us as we came back from our sabbatical. And I'm going to share it with you because of this idea of creation and the sap from the trees, um, and she references this. She says, Carrie and Dana, welcome back from your time away together. Here is our gift of maple syrup to you. You are God's gift to us. We love maple syrup. It's so natural and sweet. It's not fancy. It doesn't pretend to be something else like log cabin syrup does. It just delights us. The beautiful sugar maple needs cold winters like Dana does and will only produce sap where temperatures plunge to freezing and then rise to warmth. It graciously suffers itself to be drilled into year after year by those needing to extract its precious sap. Then that sap is vigorously boiled down to a sweet, dark, robust syrup, which sweetens the lives of all those who taste it. And then she kindly says, you are our maple syrup. She's talking about our service to the church, but I'm sharing this with you more in line with God's blessing 
to be good to us, to create these kinds of things. She says, thank you both for pouring yourselves into our lives. You are precious to us and they're irreplaceably loved. The sugar maple is extremely shade tolerant. We know that you can relate to having some shade thrown on you and its roots are very deep. It's, it draws waters from the lo- lowest levels up toward the surface where it expels it, benefiting the other plants around it. The story of its years are revealed in its rings. All of the bountiful years, all the difficult years combined to produce a beautiful, unique tree, a gift to all around it of so much goodness. We're thankful for the Lord's goodness to all, to us all, and letting us share these 10 years with you. We love you. I share that letter with you, and and typically that letter really makes me emotional, but I'm in a good place right now. I share that with you because like all of creation is generous to us. Like, like the trees, like the maple trees are generous to produce sap and generous to endure cold and generous to, to draw water up and expel that water into the plants around it. Like this, these trees are living examples of generosity. My friend, this is the, this is the reflection of our creator. We belong to a God who has a large and generous and lavish heart. And so this season and every season and every week of your life and every day of your life, I trust and pray and hope you will live in the shadow of his generosity and that you will trust his goodness and that you will not withhold yourself from him because he is not withholding himself from you. And to the degree that we withhold ourselves from him, we're simply withholding the flow of his generosity and his lavish love, and his abundant mercy, and his goodness into our lives. So trust him, because he is gooder to you than you could be to yourself. And I hope today you will become and grow more satisfied with the generosity of God. So that is Growing in the Gospel today, Wednesday. Today, it's Wednesday for me. I hope you have a great day. Thank you for taking the journey with me. And if you have questions or comments, please post them. I'm enjoying interacting with you. If you're new to the channel, welcome to the family. Keep growing with us. Have a great day. I'm praying for you. I will see you tomorrow.